Welcome friends, I'm Dr. Rajshrina Budripad and today's video is all about mast cell activation syndrome, also known as MCAS. MCAS is a disorder of mast cells and it causes multi-system inflammation. For example, it can cause skin rashes, abdominal pain, headaches, wheezing and cough, as well as nasal and sinus congestion. Unfortunately, people with MCAS are often chronically ill with a myriad of symptoms. Published literature speculates that MCAS affects up to 17% of the population, which is one out of every six individuals. Sadly, most people suffering from MCAS don't even know they have this diagnosis, and that's because of the limited awareness of this condition even among medical professionals. People suffering from this condition often have frequent urgent care or ER visits for symptoms that mimic severe allergies or even anaphylaxis. In the ER, they're often treated with steroids or epinephrine, which help reduce the symptoms but don't really address the root cause. Because the symptoms of MCAS are so diverse, patients often seek attention from numerous specialists, including allergists, endocrinologists, rheumatologists, cardiologists, gastroenterologists, and hematologists. Sadly, MCAS is not a condition that's covered in medical school, so most doctors are not even aware of this condition. Have you heard the story of the blind men who came across an elephant? Each man had a different opinion about what an elephant was really like, and that's because they were each touching a different part of the elephant's body. So they all came to different conclusions, thinking the elephant was like a wall, snake, spear, tree, fan, or rope, depending on the part of the elephant they had touched. This is a very similar analogy to a patient with MCAS seeing numerous specialists, because each specialist is just focusing on one part of the patient and coming up with a different diagnosis. MCAS can mimic so many other conditions, making it the ultimate chameleon. Rather than getting a diagnosis of MCAS, patients often end up with numerous other diagnoses, like fibromyalgia, IBS, refractory GERD, urticaria, anxiety, and multiple chemical sensitivity. Sadly, some doctors even think these patients have psychosomatism, suggesting that it's more of a psychological disorder. So it can be quite an odyssey for a patient to even get diagnosed with MCAS. They often start to research on the internet, and that's where they start to figure out that they might have MCAS. This is what inspired me to make this video, to have this information available for people looking for answers. So what are mast cells? Normally, mast cells are not the villains of our immune system. They're actually an important type of immune cell that's present in every tissue in our body. Mast cells are packed with granules, and as soon as they sense an attack or insult, they swing into action and release these granules through a process called degranulation. These granules contain over a thousand different mediators, including histamine, tryptase, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, cytokines, heparin, and proteases. This causes inflammation and swelling in tissues. This is what a mast cell looks like under an electron microscope. As you can see, the unique feature is that it's packed with granules. Mast cells react a lot quicker than other immune cells. In fact, they're the fastest immune cell to respond. For example, neutrophils take minutes to activate, and lymphocytes can take a few hours. But mast cells activate within seconds. Normally, mast cells play an important role in our immune response against allergens. For example, when a person with a peanut allergy accidentally eats a peanut, this causes their immune cells to produce IgE antibodies that are specific to the peanut protein. These IgE antibodies then bind to the mast cell, along with fragments of the peanut allergen, and this triggers the mast cell to release its granules. Mast cells also play an important role in anaphylaxis, which is a severe and life-threatening allergic reaction toward a food or environmental allergen. 
For example, when a person with a severe peanut allergy accidentally consumes a peanut, this causes the mast cells to go crazy and explode, releasing large amounts of histamine and other inflammatory mediators. This can trigger airway constriction, which can be life-threatening. This is why it's so important that patients with anaphylaxis always carry an EpiPen. Mast cells are also responsible for our allergic response towards insect venom, like a bee sting. In this case, your immune cells produce IgE antibodies that are specific to the bee venom proteins, and this triggers your mast cells to degranulate. This is why people who are allergic to bees can have a lot of pain and swelling after a bee sting. Now that we've talked about the normal behavior of mast cells, let's talk about when mast cells go awry and start misbehaving, causing mast cell activation syndrome. In mast cell activation syndrome, the mast cells become hyperactivated and they start overreacting to a myriad of stimuli. They start putting out the wrong mediators with the wrong amounts at the wrong times in the wrong places in the body and this causes the body to start reacting in ways it should not be reacting. The mast cells no longer wait for IgE antibodies to present an allergen, so we call this non-IgE-mediated mast cell activation, and it happens towards a plethora of stimuli. Things that normally do not affect mast cells start to trigger them, like temperature changes, even a hot shower, atmospheric changes, emotional stress, mechanical pressure, hormonal changes, fragrances, certain foods, exposure to mold, infections, vaccinations, and even exposure to electromagnetic fields, or EMF. People with MCAS feel like they react to everything. Even common over-the-counter medications and supplements can cause them to react. Once again, they can react to foods, weather changes, computer screens and iPhones because of the EMF, they also react to personal care products and detergents that have fragrances. They might even notice that their skin reacts to tight clothing or adhesives from tape. They can't even take a hot shower. This is Linda, one of my patients. And when I first met Linda, she felt like everything caused her flushing, itching, fatigue, and diarrhea. Linda felt like she was allergic to everything. So she had seen an allergist but was told that her test did not show any allergies. That's because in MCAS, we're dealing with non-IgE mediated mast cell activation. So although the symptoms mimic allergies, the mechanism in which the mast cells get activated is different. However, there are some patients with MCAS that do have underlying allergies. So it's important that we test for allergies by doing an IgE food and environmental blood test, which is available through most standard labs. Now let's review the many manifestations of MCAS in organs throughout our body. General symptoms include fatigue, malaise, as well as anaphylaxis. In the brain, MCAS can cause headaches, brain fog, anxiety, and insomnia. It can also cause neurological symptoms like paresthesias, which is tingling and numbness in the extremities. In the heart, MCAS can cause palpitations, and in the cardiovascular system, it can also cause swelling or angioedema, low blood pressure, and lightheadedness. In the skin, MCAS can cause hives, also known as urticaria, flushing, itching, which is also known as pruritus, and dermatographism. Coming up soon, I'm going to show you a picture to better explain dermatographism. In the nose and sinuses, MCAS can cause congestion, postnasal drip, and epistaxis, which means nose bleeding. MCAS can cause numerous gastrointestinal symptoms like bloating due to small intestine bacterial overgrowth, diarrhea or constipation, gastroesophageal reflux disease or acid reflux, as well as irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. In the lungs, MCAS can cause wheezing that mimics asthma as well as a cough. In the urinary bladder, MCAS can cause pain in the absence of infection, which is called interstitial cystitis. In the gynecological system, MCAS can cause menstrual cramps and heavy bleeding. In the musculoskeletal system, MCAS can cause joint, muscle, and bone pain.
which is why many of these patients are labeled as having fibromyalgia. Finally, in the eyes, MCAS can cause conjunctival inflammation, which presents as dryness or burning. As you can see, MCAS causes chronic, multi-system inflammation. Additionally, patients with MCAS develop numerous sensitivities, so they may start reacting to common things like hair dye or over-the-counter medications or even thyroid medication. It's important to remember that every patient with MCAS has a unique and individual presentation. So two different patients with MCAS may have a completely different set of symptoms. Patients and doctors are often frustrated because a lot of these symptoms can't be explained by routine tests and don't respond to standard treatments. Because of the wide range of symptoms, patients often undergo a lot of imaging and blood tests. But sadly, the diagnosis of MCAS is often overlooked. By the time they are diagnosed, many MCAS patients have been chronically ill for decades. This is what dermatographism looks like on the skin. It's basically redness or hives along the track of a light scratch. This is a great finding to look for on physical exam in patients with MCAS. So how does a person get MCAS? MCAS is an acquired disorder. So a person may be born with underlying genetic tendencies, but then a trigger causes acquired mutations in mast cell regulatory genes. There's a wide range of triggers for MCAS. This includes emotional or psychological stressors, physical trauma, exposure to mold, viral infections like Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes viruses, varicella, and even long COVID. Other triggers include tick-borne infections like Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, or Babesia, as well as bacterial infections like H. pylori or Bartonella. Gut inflammation could also be a trigger for MCAS. This includes small intestine bacterial overgrowth, dysbiosis, which is a bacterial imbalance, or candida, which is an overgrowth of yeast. If a person reacts adversely to a vaccination, this could also be a trigger for MCAS. Finally, exposure to environmental chemicals like heavy metals, pesticides, BPA and phthalates could also be a trigger for MCAS in a genetically predisposed individual. Usually, MCAS patients can identify a specific point in their lives when their health took a distinct turn for the worse. For example, it could be after travel, relocation, or after exposure to mold. So we've already talked about how MCAS can be an elusive diagnosis. So how do we diagnose MCAS? Great question. Let's go over the criteria. In the literature, there are three criteria that are helpful in making a diagnosis of MCAS. The first criteria is having the typical signs and symptoms of MCAS. Second, we can measure the level of tryptase on your blood work, which is one of the enzymes released by mast cells. The tryptase level should be checked when the patient is at baseline and during a flare. If there's an increase in the blood tryptase level by over 20% plus 2 nanograms per ml compared to baseline within 1-4 to four hours after the onset of a flare, this fulfills the second criteria. The third criteria is if the patient's symptoms respond to anti-mediator therapy. This means that if a patient takes antihistamines or other mast cell stabilizing medications, they notice improvement in their symptoms. Finally, it's important to rule out other diseases and conditions that could be causing similar symptoms. The nice thing about the serum tryptase level is it's easily available through most standard labs. However, there are cases of MCAS that can be missed if you're only using the serum tryptase level. Some doctors who specialize in MCAS are able to order additional 24-hour urine tests. This can test for metabolites of other compounds released by mast cells, like N-methylhistamine, prostaglandin metabolites, and leukotriene metabolites. It's important that patients have no exposure to antihistamines, steroids, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for several days before doing the blood or urine tests. 
Unfortunately, these urine tests are only measured at a few reference laboratories throughout the country and the samples need to be continuously chilled. Another helpful tool in making the diagnosis of MCAS is a tissue biopsy. You can get a biopsy of a skin rash or an internal biopsy of your intestines that can be taken during an endoscopy. The doctor has to specifically request that the pathologist stain the tissue and look for mast cells. Now there is another serious condition to be aware of called systemic mastocytosis. This is a hematologic condition where mast cells infiltrate the body causing an enlarged spleen, lymph nodes, and liver. These patients have tryptase levels that are persistently elevated over 20 nanograms per ml. The diagnosis can be confirmed with a bone marrow biopsy and it's treated by a hematologist. When I told my patient Linda that she met all the criteria for MCAS, she was actually very relieved. In fact, most patients with MCAS are actually quite grateful to finally have a diagnosis. Now let's talk about the gastrointestinal symptoms of MCAS. MCAS can cause symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. It can cause bloating, symptoms of GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease, and it can cause diarrhea or constipation. MCAS can be a big root cause of IBS. That's because the mast cells are located near the nerves in the gut and the severity of the abdominal pain often correlates with the level of tryptase and histamine in the gut. Bloating is a very common symptom seen in MCAS and that's because 40% of MCAS patients have small intestine bacterial overgrowth, also known as SIBO. So what is SIBO? SIBO is when bacteria from your large intestine backs up into your small intestine and they cause a lot of gas and bloating every time you eat. In MCAS, the mast cells activate the sympathetic nervous system and they suppress the vagus nerve which controls the parasympathetic nervous system. This combination slows the motility in the small intestine which is a big risk factor for developing SIBO. Having SIBO can actually worsen the symptoms of MCAS. Let me explain why this happens. Our body breaks down histamine through two pathways. The first is by an enzyme called diamine oxidase, or DAO, that's located in the lining of our gut. The second pathway is by an enzyme called histamine N-methyltransferase, or HNMT, and this enzyme is found inside of cells in organs throughout our body. In SIBO, there's lower levels of the DAO enzyme in the gut. Now let me show you exactly why this happens. These tiny finger-like projections are microvilli on a cell in our small intestine. At the edge of these microvilli is a protective glycoprotein layer with enzymes that help with food digestion. The problem is that in SIBO, the bacteria end up eating the glycocalyx and they also end up eating the DAO enzyme which is located in these cells with the microvilli. This is why SIBO can really worsen the symptoms of histamine intolerance as well as MCAS. To learn more about SIBO, please watch my videos which explain this condition in detail. My first video on SIBO is an in-depth explanation of the condition, and my second video reviews my herbal protocol on how to overcome SIBO. Next, MCAS can cause significant acid reflux or GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. That's because the stomach actually has histamine receptors. So when mast cells release histamine, it can trigger the stomach to produce large amounts of acid. Normally, the lining of our small intestine is made by a single layer of cells, and these cells are bound together by tight junctions. These are the cells that also carry the Dao enzyme, which normally breaks down histamines before it enters our bloodstream. If something disrupts these tight junctions between the cells, this is called leaky gut, also known as increased intestinal permeability. This can allow the histamines in your food to readily enter your bloodstream. On top of that, food particles, bacteria, and viruses can also enter the bloodstream, and this can trigger immune dysregulation that can further activate mast cells. Now some of you may be wondering, what's the difference between MCAS and histamine intolerance? That's a great question. Let's go over this. Histamine intolerance is actually more common than MCAS. 
only a certain fraction of those with histamine intolerance also suffer from MCAS. People with histamine intolerance generally react to foods that are high in histamines, like wine or aged cheeses. On the other hand, patients with MCAS have a multitude of triggers. In addition to food, they can be triggered by hot showers, weather changes, EMF, fragrances, mechanical pressure like tape or adhesives, as well as emotional stressors. People with histamine intolerance have a reduced ability to break down histamines, so their symptoms can be similar but less severe than MCAS. Patients with MCAS often also have histamine intolerance. In histamine intolerance, the blood tryptase level will be normal and does not rise during a flare. Gut microbiome dysfunction, inflammation, and SIBO is seen in both MCAS and histamine intolerance. So the gut microbiome plays a critical role in both MCAS and histamine intolerance. In both conditions, we see overpopulation with bad bacteria that are eating up the Dow enzyme, as well as increasing production of histamines from the gut. In addition to mast cells releasing histamine, histamine can also be made by bacteria. Certain bacteria in the gut produce an enzyme called histidine decarboxylase, which can turn the amino acid histidine into histamine. Fermented and aged foods also contain bacteria that produce this enzyme. Patients with both MCAS and histamine intolerance often suffer from dysbiosis, which is a bacterial imbalance in their gut microbiome. Having an overgrowth of a bacteria like Morganella, Hafnia, Proteus, Enterobacter, Enterococcus, Citrobacter, Pseudomonas, or Lactobacillus serumneri can increase the production of the enzyme histidine decarboxylase, which can increase conversion of histidine to histamine. Similarly, having dysbiosis with a yeast, like Candida, can also be problematic. And to learn more about this, please watch my video on Candida and CIFO, which I'll link in the description below. Once again, having a damaged gut can really flare up symptoms of MCAS as well as histamine intolerance. That's because of the reduced activity of the Dow enzyme, as well as the increased production of histamines from the gut. Now let's talk about foods that are often poorly tolerated in both histamine intolerance and MCAS. Aged and fermented foods have higher levels of histamine. This includes sauerkraut, aged cheeses, aged vinegars, soy sauce, and even bone broth. It's unfortunate because a lot of people consider bone broth to be a gut healing food. But for these patients, it can actually flare up their symptoms because of the high histamine content. These patients often also react to leftovers, because the longer a food is sitting in your fridge, the more time the bacteria have to produce histamine. Fish is another food that's high in histamines, especially canned fish, like tuna and sardines. Interestingly, not only are fish high in histamine, they also have inhibitors of the Dow enzyme. Just remember, the fresher the fish, the less histamine it has. Wild-caught fish that's frozen immediately may be the best option. The bad news is there are some produce items that are unsuspectingly high in histamines. This includes spinach, eggplant, avocado, and tomatoes. Next, there are some foods that increase histamine release by your mast cells. This includes citrus fruits like oranges and lemons, as well as strawberries. Although these fruits do not contain histamines, they can be a trigger, causing your mast cells to release more histamine. Now let's talk about alcohol. Most alcohol are high in histamines because they're made through a fermentation process. Alcohol also reduces the activity of the Dow enzyme in the lining of the intestines. Finally, alcohol and histamine compete for the same enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase that's involved in the breakdown of histamine. So as you can see, there are multiple reasons why alcohol would not be tolerated by someone with MCAS or histamine intolerance. To learn more about histamine intolerance as well as a low histamine diet, please check out my video which I'll link in the description below. So to summarize, there are three sources of histamines in our body. 
In MCAS, the primary source is the mast cells, which are hyperactivated. Histamines are also found in foods and can be made by certain bacteria in our gut microbiome. MCAS can also affect the nervous system, causing autonomic dysfunction. In our bodies, we have two opposing nervous systems. The sympathetic nervous system controls our fight or flight reactions, and the parasympathetic nervous system helps us rest and digest. So the parasympathetic nervous system has a calming effect on our body, and it's controlled by the vagus nerve, which comes from our brainstem and has branches that go to organs throughout our body. In MCAS, the numerous mediators released by mast cells activate the sympathetic nervous system, and they suppress the vagus nerve, which controls the parasympathetic nervous system. Symptoms of autonomic dysfunction include dizziness, lightheadedness, as well as palpitations. Normally, the vagus nerve serves as the brakes on the heart. So in MCAS, patients often notice a rapid heart rate or palpitations. They often need to see a cardiologist to rule out more serious arrhythmias. Long COVID is another big trigger for MCAS as well as autonomic dysfunction. Research shows that the COVID virus can increase activation of the aberrant mast cells. MCAS also has an association with a condition called POTS, which stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. Patients with POTS suffer from an elevated heart rate and low blood pressure. It can be diagnosed with a tilt table test, which is often done by a cardiologist. MCAS also has an association with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is an inherited condition of the connective tissue, which causes hypermobility, which means overflexible joints. Now, how does MCAS affect the brain? We know that mast cells can actually degranulate in the brain and release a lot of inflammatory mediators. All of these inflammatory chemicals released by mast cells can actually cause leaky brain, meaning it affects the blood-brain barrier. This is why patients with MCAS sometimes suffer from neuropsychiatric symptoms like anxiety, as well as brain fog, difficulty concentrating, migraine headaches, as well as insomnia. Many patients with MCAS also suffer from limbic system dysfunction. This means that certain parts of the brain become more sensitive and reactive. This is why some patients with MCAS develop a heightened sensitivity towards lights, sounds, certain physical touches, chemicals, scents, EMF, and even emotions. Now let's move on. How many of you have heard of a gene called MTHFR? It stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. It's an enzyme that plays a key role in methylation and detoxification in every cell of your body. A lot of patients with MCAS have a mutation in the MTHFR gene. This makes them slow detoxifiers. This may be another reason why they react so strongly to exposure to mold, infections, and other toxins. We've talked a lot about the Dow enzyme today, but do you remember the other enzyme called HNMT, which breaks down histamines inside of cells? This enzyme can be impacted by mutations in the MTHFR gene because it needs methyl groups to break down histamines. If you'd like to learn more, I have a whole video on the MTHFR gene, and I'll put a link in the description below. Now I want to quickly touch on the relationship between MCAS and women's hormones. When mast cells are being activated and releasing large amounts of histamine, this can actually cause menstrual cramps. This is a diagram showing the levels of women's hormones that fluctuate during the menstrual cycle. Estradiol, also known as estrogen, peaks in the first half of the month, known as the follicular phase. And progesterone peaks in the second half of the month, known as the luteal phase. Mast cells have hormone receptors, and the higher estradiol levels in the follicular phase can activate mast cells to release more histamines, and this can often cause symptoms to flare. The higher progesterone levels during the luteal phase help to increase the activity of the Dow enzyme, and this can often help to alleviate symptoms. Women who suffer from a hormone imbalance called estrogen dominance where they have high levels of estrogen that's not balanced by progesterone can actually have worse symptoms of MCAS. 
To learn how to address the estrogen dominance, please watch my video and I'll share a link in the description below. With all the different symptoms, it can be quite overwhelming. And many patients with MCAS feel frustrated with their health and wonder if they'll ever get better. The good news is there are a lot of treatments for MCAS, which I'm going to review now. Treating MCAS requires a personalized approach, and the cornerstone of therapy is to avoid any identifiable triggers for mast cell degranulation. This includes food triggers, such as high histamine foods, food allergies and sensitivities, as well as alcohol. Other possible triggers include extremes of temperature, standard medications that may have fillers, as well as mechanical irritation. Unfortunately, some patients have no identifiable or reliable triggers. You want to work with a provider who is knowledgeable about MCAS. The most effective approach is to combine symptom control along with addressing the root causes. And you may need to consult with specialists for specific symptoms to help rule out other conditions. When it comes to symptom control, the mainstay of treatment is antihistamines. H1 blockers include cetirizine, loratadine, hydroxazine, and diphenhydramine. These work to quiet the systemic symptoms caused by mast cells. Every MCAS patient is unique and different in how they respond to antihistamines. So patients often need to try different antihistamines to find which one works the best. Histamine II blockers like famotidine work to block histamines in the stomach and reduce symptoms of acid reflux. Next, we have leukotriene inhibitors like Montelukast. Chromalin is a direct mast cell stabilizer. Other medications used for symptom control include aspirin as well as steroids like prednisone. Finally, there's a medication called omalizumab that's a monoclonal antibody that's used in patients with severe symptoms like recurrent anaphylaxis who have true underlying allergies. It works by binding free IgE antibodies so that it doesn't trigger mast cells. These patients also need to carry an EpiPen, which can be life-saving in anaphylaxis. Another medication that's helpful in MCAS is low-dose naltrexone, also known as LDN. Research shows that it helps to modulate the immune system, and it also helps with restless leg syndrome, which is commonly seen in MCAS. One of the problems is that MCAS patients often react to the fillers present in medications, even those found in over-the-counter antihistamines. So your doctor may need to prescribe your medications through a compounding pharmacy, where they can make it without any fillers. Now let's talk about more natural things that can also help your symptoms, like natural antihistamines. Histamine support is a natural supplement that has quercetin, vitamin C, NAC, stinging nettle, and bromelain that can work to stabilize mast cells and reduce symptoms. The recommended dose is two capsules twice a day. To help support your immune system, it's also helpful to supplement with vitamin D3 with K2, vitamin C, as well as zinc. MCAS patients also benefit from detoxification support. This includes methyl B complex, which promotes methylation. It's especially helpful because remember, a lot of patients with MCAS have a mutation in the MTHFR gene. Essential magnesium can help to keep your bowels regular, improve the quality of your sleep, and it also serves as a cofactor for several detox pathways in your liver. Glutathione is the master antioxidant and detoxifier for your cells, and it's especially helpful if there's any exposure to mold, chemicals, or other biotoxins. Finally, liver support is a natural botanical blend to help promote phase 1 and phase 2 detox pathways in the liver. Next, omega-3 fish oil has essential fatty acids that can help lower inflammation in the body. CoQ10 is a powerful antioxidant that can help support the mitochondria, which are the energy powerhouses of the cell. Healing your gut is paramount to the healing process in MCAS. Undigested food can often trigger more mast cell reactions. That's why it's helpful to take Digestive Enzyme Pro, which is a strong and effective broad-spectrum enzyme. The suggested dose is 1-2 to two capsules before or after every meal. What about probiotics? 
Because MCAS patients are sensitive, it's helpful to start with a lower dose probiotic, like our probiotic 20 billion with S. boulardii. This contains many beneficial strains of Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium. Then you can gradually increase your dose to probiotic 100 billion. If you're treating SIBO with my herbal protocol, the preferred probiotic is the Spore Probiotic IgG. Herbal antimicrobials can be used to treat dysbiosis, SIBO, or candida overgrowth. These natural compounds have potent antimicrobial properties, and they include berberine pro, oregano oil, allicidin, and candida support. To learn how to implement these herbal antimicrobials, please watch my videos covering my gut healing protocols. I'll share the link for these videos in the description below. What about healing gut inflammation? L-glutamine and IgG guard are the supplements that we can use to heal gut inflammation as well as heal leaky gut. L-glutamine is an amino acid that's the food for the cells lining your small intestine and it can help seal up the tight junctions. IgG guard is immunoglobulins derived from bovine serum that can work to bind toxins and microbes in the gut and rapidly heal gut inflammation. A big part of healing gut inflammation is avoiding inflammatory foods. This includes your IgE food allergies, gluten and dairy, which are the most common food sensitivities, refined sugar, processed foods, alcohol, as well as restaurant oils. To learn more about how to heal gut inflammation and leaky gut, please watch my video and I'll share a link in the description below. Now let's talk more about addressing the various root causes in MCAS. We've already talked about healing the gut. Next, for mold exposure, it's really important to remediate it from your home and to work on detoxifying it from your body. It's important to treat any underlying infections, for example, like an H. pylori infection in the stomach. You also want to test and address any heavy metal exposure, like mercury, lead, or arsenic. You also want to monitor and support your thyroid and adrenal glands. Finally, it's important to promote detox pathways to help your body eliminate toxins. Here are some ways to help support your detox pathways. First, you want to make sure that you're having a full and complete bowel movement every day. By taking magnesium at bedtime, this can help to keep your bowels regular. Other natural ways to detox include Epsom salt baths, lymphatic massage, as well as acupuncture. It's also important that you're breathing in really clean air, so you might want to get a HEPA filter. It may be helpful to see a specialist for emotional work to help with limbic system impairment. The brain sends a lot of signals to the immune system, which can trigger mast cells. So by calming the brain, we can actually help the body go back into a state of homeostasis. Calming modalities like meditation, yoga, and diaphragmatic breathing can also be helpful. Next, a lot of MCAS patients are affected by EMF, so it may be helpful to distance yourself from EMF by using wires instead of wireless connections whenever possible. It can also be helpful to turn off your phone at night or use airplane mode. My patient Linda is one of my MCAS success stories. We took a gradual and step-by-step -step approach which took about six months. After we healed her gut, she felt the most dramatic improvement in her health and told me this was the healthiest she had felt in years. Let's review the key points from today's video. MCAS is when mast cells become overreactive, causing chronic, multi-system inflammation. Patients with MCAS react to a myriad of triggers, including foods, temperature changes, smells, and even EMF. MCAS is an acquired disorder. It can happen in a person with underlying genetic tendencies when exposed to a trigger that causes acquired mutations in mast cell regulatory genes. In order to successfully treat MCAS, you have to combine symptom management along with addressing the root causes. Finding and working with a knowledgeable provider can be extremely helpful. Healing the gut is paramount to healing a patient with MCAS. Finally, identifying and avoiding your triggers can make a big difference. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, 
please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Be sure to post all your questions and comments below. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.